Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to join you today. And I uh, thank you also for your attention to STEM. Whether you talk about climate change, the environment, digitalization, you will not get around this topic. And uh, we just need to ensure that more young people are not only capable, but also motivated uh, to work in this field. Let me just, you know, share a few of my slides. Definitely. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, if you think how our world has changed since the early 2000s when we started our work on assessing learning outcomes through PISA, you know, technologies gave students access to the knowledge that before they only got through their teacher. 2006, when we did our third assessment, was the year before the iPhone was invented. Now, Twitter was still the sound of a bird. Uh, and then you could see 2009, social media, 2012, robotics, cloud computing, biogenetics. And then, of course, you know, ultimately, the advent of artificial intelligence that has changed everything. Huge amount of technological change in our education systems. Now, but if you look actually at our capacity in education to respond to schools as measured by PISA, and you take, you know, the most advantaged countries, the countries of the OECD, you could see that barely, you know, anything has changed. We spent more on education, but we have not got more people doing better in a rapidly changing world. No. Fortunately, and you know, very important in STEM, we have only a small minority of students actually being able reliably to distinguish fact from opinion. No. It's a little bit better than in the year 2000 when we started, but again, in a dramatically changed world. No. Of course, you know, this is the average and you do see some countries that did better than this. Now, you can see, for example, the regions in China that took part in PISA have moved to the top. You can see a country like Singapore moving from good to great. In Europe, Estonia, now, again, you know, one of the poorer nations in Europe just moving forward. Now, you can see a country like Portugal now, making its way to the OECD average or Poland. Now, countries that actually you wouldn't rank first when you think about them. But they're actually very, very good when it comes to educating more people better. Even at the bottom of the scale, you can see countries like Peru or Albania making steady progress. Now, countries like Brazil, countries like, you know, Turkey. Sweden is an interesting case. You know, for a long time, they went backwards and suddenly they made their way back. And that means really we can change this. And the position that you find in the PISA league table here on the right side, has always a history, the history of what we have done in education, in schooling. This is our future, our schools today. is going to be our economy, our society tomorrow. And of course, you know, we are living in a time of disruptions. Our eyes are still very much focused on the pandemic that has, you know, put into a question a lot of what we do in education. And the future will always surprise us. Climate change is going to disrupt our lives a lot more than the pandemic and artificial intelligence puts a lot of what we do in education to a real test. We know how to educate second class robots, you know, people who are good at repeating what we told them, but what's going to make us human in a world in which the kind of things that are easy to teach and test have also become easy to digitize, to automate. And there are lots of other kinds of, you know, drivers, forces that are oblige us to think differently about education, to see education really as a critical investment into our future. When we think about STEM, you know, let's look at the economic imperative. If you look at the companies that are, you know, changing the world these days, they are all companies that deal with intangibles, with knowledge, with ideas, now that spread, you know, ideas and so on. Technology is not the end, it's the means here, but you can see whoever deals with knowledge. It's very successful. That kind of technology, that STEM aspect is very important. I raise it also because when we talk about STEM in school, you know, we often leave the T and the E out. In the end, in school, we teach mathematics in very abstract ways. We teach science in the form of formulas and equations. But STEM really is about, you know, that engineering aspect, that technology aspect, students doing something. Science is not about accumulating dead knowledge about scientific disciplines. It's actually being able to think like a scientist, to design an experiment, to distinguish questions that are scientifically investigable from those that are not. And that is often short change, but that is what is changing the world. No? The traditional Fortune 500s still exist, but they're no longer the drivers 
of our economies. No? Intangible innovation. You look at the number of patents, no? how they evolve. You can see how ideas and knowledge are expanding ex exponentially because this is what's changing our world. And they all rely on STEM skills. And then takes the environment. No? We live as if there would be 1.7 Earths for us. No? That's what we consume in terms of natural resources. We all know, everybody knows, this is not sustainable. But how do we change it? Why well, it's going to require a lot of STEM in ingenuity plus behavioral change. But behavioral change is also very closely linked to STEM knowledge. Our PISA assessments show that where students, you know, they are more aware of the science behind the environment. They were much more ready to take difficult and tough decisions now. And then there's a wisdom of crowds, you know. In the year 2000, you could say basically, look, you know, we all learned from prefabricated sources. We had a few television anchors who told us about the world, a few newspaper editors who curated the news. Today, we are all our own authors. Now. And we live in this digital bazaar that is, you know, cracking apart under its own pressures. Now. But are we ready for that? You know, when we looked in the last PISA assessment, to what extent can young people navigate the digital world, you know, distinguish between fact from opinion, manage ambiguity, you could see that, well, in some countries on the left side, in Singapore, Korea, parts of China, you have at least, you know, two thirds of students ready to manage this. But one third is still not capable of doing this. In many countries in Europe, you can see it's the majority of young people who have all the technology at their fingertips, but who are not ready to really use that technology productively. This is a concern. You can say, well, you know, humans are always better to invent new tools than to use them wisely. But, you know, in the more times in which we live today, your decisions can have huge implications for people in many places around the world. It's about consumer behavior. It's about voting behavior. All of those things basically come down to this kind of knowledge and skills. There are a lot to do that we have to do. And you can see it's all related to STEM. And then comes digitalization. Technology has been incredibly democratizing. <clears throat> Everybody can collaborate. Everybody can contribute. But it's also concentrated power to a rate that we've never seen before. Technology has been incredibly particularizing. The smallest voice can be heard everywhere. But it's also incredibly homogenizing, squashing individually. Now, cultural uniqueness, <coughs> questions around identity become so important these days. Technology has been incredibly empowering. You know, The most successful companies these days are not created by a big idea. They're created by a big industry. They have the product before they get the money. But technology can also be incredibly disempowering when we become the slaves of algorithms. You know, they tell us whether to turn left or right, or whether we are fit or not fit. One thing is clear, if you do not understand the idea of an algorithm, you're going to be soon the victim of an algorithm. So technology is another of these big, big, big drivers and it changes in the nature of companies. And you know, a digital platform technology drives the reorganization of firms. You no longer know what is a big or a small company. You know, a few people can change the world. That's the world in which we live in. And you can see many jobs are digitally intensive now. now people have often this idea, well, there are a few digital jobs, but no, most jobs are actually extremely sensitive to technology. You need a lot of technology skills, now. at least half of the jobs in many countries in Europe. Now. So, this is here to stay. These bars are only growing longer. No? That's where the future lies. And also the green transition will impact some sectors a lot more than others. We're going to see shifts. It not means we have fewer jobs, but the nature of jobs will change. Some things will be requiring more people, others less, and we need to get people ready to adopt. And when you look at the list here, the ones that are actually going upwards have all to do with STEM in one or the other way. And then keep in mind, you know, that the kind of things that are easy to teach and easy to test have also become easy to digitize, to automate, to outsource. We're seeing a decline in routine tasks, an increase in technology-intensive tasks. And you put the two things together, well, you know, 
that is the future of war. And once again, those are not, you know, very practical skills. That's the future of the skills that requ is required. Look here, you know, you can see on the vertical axis the numeracy skills. No? Again, mathematics, a very, very important part of STEM. And then on the horizontal axis, the risk of automation in countries. And the two are closely linked. You know, the better skilled your population on STEM, at least one dimension on STEM, the more you are protected from the risks of automation, the more you can draw on the benefits of automation. You know, the, 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 the more, you know, shortage you have of those skills, the poorer your population is skilled, the more you are at risk of, you know, losing out on the automation trends. And that shows us that actually STEM skills can be a very polarizing force. Those who have them never had the opportunities they have today. Those who don't actually face increasing risks. Now, contrast this with this picture. We asked 15 year olds in Pisa, you know, what do you want to do in your life at age 30? And you can see that many teenagers aspire to jobs that are at a high risk of automation. Our education systems often educate young people for our past, not for their future. No. And by the way, to become a STEM scientist, an engineer, you know, you need to see them. You cannot be what you can't see. You cannot teach formulas and equations. STEM is something that you have to, have to experience. No. Very important. I'm going to come back to this at the end. And then let me just briefly touch on the social imperative. It's not just about, you know, the economic side of it. No. Think about this, you know, the lack of knowledge about STEM is causing all these conspiracy theories, uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, you know, theories around us. No? The pandemic has been a good illustration. No? What is very clear is, you know, you cannot ignore the forces of Mother Nature. Mother Nature will always follow the dictates of STEM, you know. And those people who, you know, give politics a priority or ideologies, they pay a steep price for this. So we better understand that nature and enable people to work on this. I think that's very, very important. When you look actually, the young people who want to actually do a career in STEM, it's really, really interesting. Look at, you know, on the PISA test, some of the highest performing education systems, Korea, Japan, China, Germany. Students have a lot of STEM knowledge, but actually very few of them want to do a career in STEM. So it's not so easy. It's not just about teaching more STEM in school and you're going to get a lot of people going into STEM professions. It doesn't work out like this. No? Look at the United States. You know, the United States does not do well in STEM. No? Students perform quite poorly on the PISA test in science and math and so on. But it's one of the most populous destinations for people. It's very sort of highly prestigious. So isn't that a paradox? Students doing well on STEM, not wanting to do this, and students not doing well, actually being very you know, high in their aspirations. Well, we can actually resolve that paradox. And I think it's very, very important to understand this dynamic. When students do not enjoy science, you can see the relationship between science performance and, you know, career aspirations. It's very poor. Even better performance doesn't relate to greater career aspirations. Well, when students do enjoy science in education, you can see how that relationship suddenly becomes strong. And that really tells us we have to work on this, you know. STEM learning needs to be fun. It needs to be interesting. It needs to be related to the real life, to the real problems. Not, you know, an abstract world of formulas and equations taught without any passion. If you want to translate better STEM skills into better, you know, career aspirations, you have to work on that. That kind of social, that enjoy, enjoyment aspect. Very, very important. And um, it's also about, you know, teaching the intellectual methodologies of STEM. What does it mean? You know, that can-do attitude that STEM brings with this. You can change the world for better or worse with this. Often, you know, I must say we teach STEM like religion. You know, we make people believe in certain scientific paradigms and we make them do practices. And then at the end, you know, we make them repeat what we have told them. That has nothing to do with STEM. STEM is really about thinking like a scientist. 
is about the cap capability of students to explain phenomena scientifically. It's about their capability to evaluate and design scientific inquiry and also to interpret evidence in scientific ways. No? That's what it means to be scientifically competent. Yes, you need the knowledge in biology, chemistry, physics and for, for do, doing this. You need technology, skills, and so on. But the underpinning paradigms of science are different. It's being able, you know, can you describe and appraise scientific investigations? Can you uh, propose ways of addressing questions scientifically? Can you analyze, evaluate competing claims about a phenomenon? Build your own hypothesis, test them, design your own experiments. That's really what competency in STEM needs to be, and that's what, what STEM education needs to look like. Of course, you know, it has to do with knowledge. There is knowledge of the disciplines. Knowledge in engineering, knowledge in technology, in mass, in science, and so on, in engineering. But actually, what we often forget is that epistemic understanding, that understanding of concepts. We teach students how to calculate an exponential function. We don't teach them the idea, the concept of an exponential function. But if we did, our students would be so much more successful. Basically, uh, you know, a phenomenon like the pandemic, if we had, you know, really internalized the ideas of an exponential function, we would have, you know, started with 10,000 doctors rather than 300. This is something, you know, we as humans are born into a linear world. Time is linear, space is linear, that's where we are comfortable. But actually the world of STEM can open us, open entirely new worlds for us. We can engage in new ways of thinking if we teach them well. So that epistemic understanding, that conceptual understanding of the disciplines is at least as important. Thinking like a scientist is perhaps even more important than just knowing facts and figures in science, which will change. You know, that is the surface knowledge that will change, will be different tomorrow. But the deep underpinning paradigms of science, of technology, of mathematics, they need to teach, they need to be internalized by students. And again, you know, you don't see so much of that in school because our school books are often a mile wide and an inch deep. They're very superficial. The biggest challenge for teachers in STEM, teach fewer things at greater depths. Easy to say, very, very hard to do. But it's also to do with attitudes. The attitudes and beliefs they have towards STEM. Do young people believe STEM skills are a force for good or a threat to our environment? And we distinguish actually in our PISA assessments between attitudes towards science. No? Am I I'm interested in physics? You know, I'm interested in chemistry, as opposed to scientific attitudes, you know, whether students value the scientific way of approaching problems. Unfortunately, it's contested today. In the past, you know, you took it for granted that that is valued. Today, you know, everybody creates their own reality. STEM is just one of many ways of thinking suddenly. But those attitudes do matter, not the importance that we attribute to STEM. Do we take, you know, responsible decisions? When the climate changes, when there is a pandemic, these are difficult decisions that require, you know, and that those attitudes are very influential to shape our behavior. And when you look at this, you see that I'm not just talking about the people who become scientists. We should, you know, lose that, you know, that is not the most important thing to build, you know, STEM competencies, knowledge and attitudes among those who you want to become tomorrow's engineers. No, it's about the general skills in our populations. We hugely depend on more people having stronger skills in those kinds of things. No? So if you think about the future of STEM education, it's about conceptual understanding do we believe in a common reality in an objective reality or is you know everybody has the old version of the truth do we believe in that idea of causal reasoning that we can actually test skills are young people able to engage in probabilistic thinking most phenomena in the world of today are not of certainties they are probabilistic we need to find signal in noise we need to assign you know credibility levels and use them we need to Always be able to put into question what we have found. No? Science is about not just learning, but equally important about unlearning and relearning 
when we have discovered, when we have made new discoveries. No? Human cognition. And then, you know, finally, that scientific optimism, that gross mindset, which is so critically important. No? And actually, this is also something that we are starting to measure in PISA. And you can see, actually, on the vertical axis, you have the performance of students in PISA. On the, on the horizontal axis, the share of students with a gross mindset. And you can see they are related. Now, a country like Estonia that is so successful in PISA also has students that, you know, believe in themselves. They believe they can overcome difficulties. They can, you know, uh, the sky is the limit for them. In Indonesia, you have many students who, you know, struggle academically, but also think that, you know, success is about the intelligence I was born with. So why should I struggle hard? You can see those things are related. And not just with PISA performance, you can see students with a gross mindset that can do attitude that STEM brings with it. They were motivated to master difficult tasks. They had a greater sense of self-efficacy and they were less afraid of failure. Think how important that is. If you want young people to be creative, you have to give them space to experiment. If they experiment, they need to take risk. If they take risk, they, you know, make mistakes. And if our education systems do not help students learn from and with mistakes, maybe they won't become so creative. No? Well, that's all in your hands when you do a, you know, develop a good STEM education. It's about focus, no? teaching fewer things at greater depths. It's about rigor. It's about coherence. It's about, you know, interdisciplinary, helping students to think across the boundaries of discipline, of transferability. And very important, STEM education can't be taught on a whiteboard alone. The authenticity is really important. The alignment and also in the student agency. You know, can students, you know, design an experiment? Can they build something of intrinsic positive wise? You know? That's what engineers do. We should do more of that in schools. You know? making things that are really, really relevant for young people. No? So I think those are some elements that I wanted to, to share with you of how we can build a 21st century STEM education. No? Once again, you know, this is what our future is going to be about. And we don't just need expert students. We need a lot of more expertise about STEM in our general populations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Schleicher, uh, for showing us how improvements in STEM education are amongst the best investment we can make into our future. And uh, I really like some of the comments you made about how it's, uh, it's really about the sky is our limit, especially if we're enthusiastic about it. But now you also mentioned that not all educational systems are investing enough, for example, on career guidance. Uh, and we see that in many countries, the teachers have also to act as career advisors. They're the ones that have to say what kind of outcomes there are. And uh, so that's on top of their existing duties. Now, to how, how do you have any idea of how we could better support teachers in providing constructive career guidance to their students? Yeah, you know, that aspect of career guidance is very important. And uh, also keep in mind, the most important career decisions you do not make, you know, when you leave school. The most important career decisions you make when you enter school, in your first grade of schooling, that's when you decide, you know, this is a subject I love. This is where I'm going to spend my time on. And 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 uh, the subjects, probably your favorite subject in primary school had a lot more to do with the teacher you met than with the content of the subject. So actually bringing that enthusiasm into the school. But when it comes to career guidance, we shouldn't overly rely on teachers. We should just do a lot better to build stronger connections between the world of school and the world outside school. Now bring young people to see an engineer, bring engineers or you know whoever works with them into schools. Now, it's that authenticity that creates the attitudes, the expectations, the aspirations of young people, particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds. Now, if you have never met a scientist, why would you want to become a scientist? Definitely. And, and we were looking at that these, earlier before when we had all these projects connecting researchers with schools as well and how to connect these two worlds. You also mentioned the, that there's a, a bit of a missing of the engineering and technology parts. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a lot of focus on this S and the M in a way. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we have also the situation in, in uh, vocational educational training and vocational education schools that are, are they're not mentioned as much and they're still considered less than uh, mainstream schools. So is there a trend as well changing in, in giving these other career paths or other studies more visibility or the respect and knowledge, the acknowledgement that they deserve as well? Yeah, actually, I would say that vocational education often does better 
uh, you learn with real people, you learn to work on real projects. When you make a mistake, it has real consequences. All of those things have actually very relevant to STEM. I would say actually academic uh, education is more to learn and making learning more interesting, more engaging, more authentic, more related to the, the application. STEM is a lot about you know putting ideas into practice, not just you know accumulating theoretical knowledge. And uh, I, I think it can be done. You know there are lots of you know project based learning environments these days emerging. The many schools doing a very, very good job. But, you know, schools are too good to keep students inside and the rest of the world outside. And we need to actually open the school walls. And then I think we're going to have a lot more uh, interesting and relevant learning environments. Now, once again, you know, as a great teacher in STEM, you know, don't need to be more than a good instructor. You need to be a good coach, a good mentor, a good facilitator, a good evaluator, a good designer of really le innovative learning environments. Now, so, so the role of teachers continues to be imperative, basically. The, the, you were saying that the teachers should not be the only ones taking care of these career guidance, but they still have on their shoulders a big part of this training and development, and they have to go beyond their content, and we have to continue supporting them. I also like that you're mentioning the going outside the school. We've had uh, projects like Most or Make It Open that were mentioned earlier today, that they're all addressing this out of like open schooling attitudes and how to go beyond. But of course, that's the problem connecting that back to the assessment, isn't it? And how yeah. do you integrate that? Yeah, you know, I think one of the biggest mistakes that we made in education over the last centuries was to divorce learning and assessment. You know, we ask students to pile up a lot, a lot, a lot of knowledge over many years. And then one day we ask them to come back and say, tell me everything that you learned in all your schooling career in a very contrived, constrained setting. And, and that actually is part of the problem that has made STEM learning so mile wide and so inch deep. I think if we want to change that, we have to better integrate the learning and the assessment components. And again, I think if you work in vocational education, that's actually done really well. You know, every day when you, you know, work on something, you'll have people talking to you about this and you get this immediate feedback. Uh, if we do better on this in, in general school, I think we'll do better in getting more people interested in STEM as well. So you could go back to showing and learning from each other and uh, learning from the different programs that work. And uh, as Mark Durando was saying earlier this morning, uh, the question of connecting assessment again with mm -hmm. learning, as you were saying now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you for sharing your expertise on the topic. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you.